For the last two weeks, we've been traveling the gospel road, the road of reality and the road of sacrifice. Today we're going to look at the road of salvation, the foundational passage from the Bible for this service. This series is found in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14, where Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. I wonder if you've ever heard of the story of the business executive who worked at his office in downtown Toronto, somewhere on about the 40th floor of one of those business towers. He worked quite late on a Friday night to be able to go on two weeks vacation up to his cottage up north in the uh, Halliburton area. Having worked hard all week, he was really quite tired, so he called his wife through the hands-free car phone just to talk and try to be more alert as he drove home. His wife, on hearing that he was on the 401, quickly told him to be careful, since the news just reported that one driver was going the wrong way down the express lanes. What do you mean one driver, he shouted. They're all going the wrong way. Oh, I recall hearing a true story of a couple who, about 50 years ago, were traveling through northern Ontario to go out west. And they came across a small motel with a restaurant, ate supper, and went to bed a while later. At, before dawn broke the next day, they grabbed a quick coffee, neither usually ate breakfast, and they headed out. Later, while looking for a place to stop and have a coffee about mid-morning, late morning, and maybe a bite to eat, they discovered they had just spent over three hours traveling east. They had taken a right out of the motel parking lot instead of taking a left heading west. They quickly ate lunch, hit the road, and then checked into the same motel they had roomed in the night before. This time, they were careful to leave the car parked pointing west in the direction they should have gone the first thing that morning. That's like a lot of people traveling the road of life. There's a lot of people who think they are traveling on the narrow road, but they're not. They're traveling the other way on the road to destruction, on the wide or broad road. As some of the people whom Paul was writing to in the book of Romans. If you would turn with me to that book of Romans and go to chapter 10, we're going to read a few verses out of chapter 10. Paul is writing this letter to those who form the church, the Christian church in the city of Rome. The majority of the people in this church are Gentile, meaning they are of non-Jewish descent. But there's a significant minority that are Jews who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah. These Jews would have had been raised being taught what we call the Old Testament. And for the Jew, the law of Moses was everything. If they followed that, they believed that they were not only pleasing God, but could gain a right standing or right relationship with God, and through that could gain eternal life. Romans 10, verse 1. Brethren, that is, fellow Christians, Jews and Gentiles alike, my heart's desire and my prayer to God is for them. Now he's narrowing that to Jews who don't believe in Jesus as Messiah and God's perfect sacrifice for human sin. My prayer to God for them is for their salvation. Now, when Paul says salvation, he means from the consequences of sin, which is death, but also salvation being on, from being on the road that leads to destruction. So the consequences of sin in this life, the, the negative things that happen, but also salvation from being on that broad road to destruction. Verse 2 says, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God but not in accordance with knowledge. It's like driving on the highway in northern Ontario, thinking all the while you're going west, when actually you're heading east. You've got zeal. Oh, we're going to make good time. We're going to make good miles today. 
But there's no knowledge in that because you're actually heading the wrong way. You're heading east instead of actually heading west. Wow. Let's keep reading verse 3. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. But the problem was that they missed the fact that the law could only make them outwardly clean with God. It could never touch what was wrong on the inside. The moral and spiritual toxic waste dump at the core couldn't even begin to be touched by the law. All the law could do was put up a fence around that moral toxic waste dump and, and try to contain it. But it still seeped into everything else around. Every relationship, every part of their life, even their relationship with God. As Paul says in chapter 3, verse 20, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified, that is, declared to be innocent in, and in right standing in God's sight, in his sight, in God's sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul is saying that all the law can do and could do is make you aware of what sin is and what it is not. It was like the law was a mean school teacher smacking her desk with her yardstick every time you got it wrong. Bang! Wrong! Do it again! Herbert, up to the chalkboard now! Oh, sorry. I was, I was in a bit of a flashback there. Oh, dear. I think I'm all right now. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, the law is like a tyrant, a, a mean school teacher. And even though you might get it right 99 times out of 100, the 100th time, you don't. And it means that you're a lawbreaker. You've got to start rebuilding your righteousness all over again. That's what Paul is saying in the next verse of chapter 10. That's verse 5. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. Or, in other words, what he's saying is, you will have to keep on obeying the law, keep on doing the things the law says over and over and over again, hoping somehow you'll finally find the key that unlocks the mystery of right standing or right relationship with God. If you're going to practice the righteousness through the law you got to keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it keep doing it there's no stopping and Paul goes on to say in verse 6 but the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven that is to bring Christ down or who will descend into the abyss that is to bring Christ down up from the dead. In other words, the key to a right relationship with God isn't a mystery. It isn't a mystery that's so high or so deep nobody can actually ever really get it. No. Paul is saying we don't have to go up to heaven. We don't have to go down into the abyss to bring him up. This isn't some hidden knowledge that only a few really wise and well-trained can understand. This isn't some secret wisdom reserved only for the privileged few. If we look at verse 8, but what does it say? That is Scripture, what we call the Old Testament. What does it say? The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. The mystery of a relationship with God is so close, that is, the word of faith which we are preaching. Let's keep going. Verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. The way to be in a right relationship with God is never left in doubt. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. But the two have to line up. 
You can't go confessing with your mouth one thing and have something else in your heart. Someone once told me that some time ago they were working at a job site for a number of weeks, quite a distance from where they lived. I mean, hundreds of miles away from where they lived. Actually, a couple thousand, I think. And he got to talking to the co-worker about being away from home and missing their wives. When this guy pointed to his wedding ring and in all seriousness said, this thing is only good for a hundred mile radius, you know. He was serious. The ring said 100% commitment, but his mouth said 100 mile radius. Wow. You know what? Some people act that way with Jesus. They do. They sing Jesus is Lord on Sunday and live the rest of the week as though they don't know who He is. For them, Jesus is only Lord within a 20 meter radius of the front doors of the church. Oh, they can sing His name here and use it as a curse word at work or at school. They can say Jesus is Lord and act like His Lordship has no bearing on their family life, their sex life, their finances, their free time at their workplace. What is it that Jesus said in Matthew 7? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. It's a whole lot more than just saying the words, Jesus is Lord. Paul says we need to confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. Yes, but we need to believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead. It's about living out a life in life every day, every hour, every minute, in every circumstance. The Lordship of Jesus. Back in Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, Paul said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. That means right standing with God. And with the mouth, he confesses, resulting in salvation. What does it mean to believe that God raised Jesus from the dead? Well, to really unpack what that means would take at least another sermon. But let me try to condense it this way. Remember the two roads that uh, we talked about from what Jesus said in Matthew 7? The wide road to destruction and the narrow road to life? Jesus traveled the road to destruction right to the end for you. And even though he never sinned, he suffered the consequence of sin in your place when he hung on the cross and he died. But now God raised him from death to eternal life and he lives beyond the grip of that destruction and death. Belief and confession now places his life in you and your life in him by faith. And it also changes the direction of your life. 180 degrees from traveling, traveling on the road to destruction to traveling on the narrow road of life. I trust that you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, but not just a confession here. That's a lived out life every day. And that you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, which means he's beyond death. And when you connect your life to him by faith, you're in him and he in you. You have the gift of eternal life and will be able to experience the fullness of that when you finally leave this earth and are able to be in heaven with God forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. We praise you for this road of salvation, which we only find through Jesus. He said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the truth of your word. Help us to live out this truth as we walk on this narrow road. We praise you and thank you. Lord Jesus, you are Lord. 
Amen.